All right, in this video, I want to explain a little bit about equal potential lines. They have some rules. And I also want to show you that there is a connection between this world of electric potential and this world of electric fields. I'm going to stress this point again and again. Electric potential and electric fields are two ways of describing the same phenomenon. That charges are able to interact with each other at a distance, and how does that happen? Electric fields say that a charged particle creates this field in space, and that field then will interact with another charge that's inside of it, and it'll cause it to either be attracted or repelled from the charge creating the field. Electric potential says that there is this potential field that surrounds a charged particle, and if there's any difference between two points in that electric potential field, then the charge will want to move from that higher to lower potential or from lower to higher potential. Okay, So it's two ways of explaining action at a distance. But fortunately, physics is physics, which means you can connect those two worlds. So it turns out that V is equal to, or the potential difference between two spots in space right, is equal to E times D the electric field times the distance between these two points. So if I have, you know, some point over here, x1, and some point over here, x2, and there's some v1 here, and there's some v2 here, all right, obviously that's going to have a potential difference, right? If these values are different, there's going to be a delta v that's equal to v2 minus v1, all right? Well, that delta v is simply equal to the electric field in this space times the distance between these two points. In other words, x2 minus x1, which we'll just call d. Okay, so once again, we can determine the electric, or yeah, the electric potential by multiplying the electric field in that space times the distance between that space, and vice versa, I can just solve for e. The electric field in a certain space between two points is just equal to the change in potential between those two points divided by the distance between them. Okay, so now we've found a way to link these two worlds. All right, and with that said, I also want to look at some rules that lines of equal potential have. So let's say that, you know, again, we have some kind of capacitor and there's like a whole bunch of negative charges here, negative, 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 and I have all these here that's positive, 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 positive right? And they go from here to here, here to here, here to here. Right, these are the electric field lines. Okay, so these then are the electric field lines, right? That's the E field, all right? The equal potential lines are going to be these perpendicular lines r ranging from one side to the other. So the, the picture that's on the slide right here has, you know, this slide at like zero volts, this slide over here, or this um, end of the capacitor is at 1.5 volts. And so here, everywhere along this line would be 1.2 volts. Everywhere along this line would be 0.6 volts. Okay? So we have here an equal potential line, equal potential line, equal potential line. <laughs> I'm going to sneeze, and that's okay because I don't want to restart this video. All right, back to it. So we have... Um, a rule that kind of becomes obvious from this little configuration, okay? So one rule is that equal potential lines and electric field lines are always perpendicular to each other, okay? That it will always be the case. So an another way that we could look at that is, let's say that we have a charged particle over here. So I have a positively charged particle. We know that the equal potential lines look like this. Right? These are all the points where you have equal potential all the way around. And we know that the electric field lines look like this. So what do you see there? You notice that these are perpendicular, perpendicular, perpendicular. Okay? So we know that. We know that electric field lines and uh, equal potential lines are always perpendicular to each other. Um, the second thing we notice, which is almost common sense, equal potential lines can never cross. Because remember, at an equal potential line, the potential is equal all the way around it. 
So if I had one equal potential line here that was, let's say, 10 volts, and one equal potential line here that was 5 volts, and they crossed at this point, what would that mean? It would mean that at that point, you have a very, very confused point in space because it says, it thinks that it's 10 volts and 50 volts at the same time, which is impossible. So electric potential lines can't cross. All right. Um, I now want to move on to this problem that says, why is lightning jagged? Okay. Another interesting observation about lightning that no one ever seems to question is, why is it so jiggity 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 jiggity, right? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows the answer to that? Well, I know the answer to that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the answer. So, um, in order to solve this problem, we need to use this connection between voltage, potential difference, and electric field. So, I'm going to write that down again. We know that electric field, or the electric potential difference, is equal to the electric field in that space divided by the distance between the two points that we're checking the electric potential difference between, right? So, we have this problem that says thunderclouds may develop a voltage difference of 5 times 10 to the 7 volts. Given that an electric field is 3 times 10 to the 6 volts per meter uh, is required to produce an electric spark, um, that might look familiar. Remember, that's like the dielectric breakdown. That's the electric field that's strong enough for electrons to actually jump from one space to another. Um, estimate the length of a thundercloud lightning bolt, meaning the, each little chunk of a lightning bolt in order for one charge to jump from one spot to another, okay? In other words, we're solving for D, right? In other words, we're solving for what is, what is the distance that, um, that you need in order for a big enough potential difference to, to, to build up and the right size electric field so that those charges are willing to jump from one space to another, all right? So, in this problem, it, tell, it says that the potential difference is about 5 times 10 to the 7 volts. Okay, so once again, let's just say here's our lightning bolt. I'm going to make this very simple. Right, and so this distance here, that's the length. Right on the other side. This distance here, that is the length, D, with which you have the right potential difference and the right electric field in order for the electrons to, to feel enough motivation to jump from here to here, all right? And this would be the little jagged piece of that lightning that you see. And you can see it in the picture here how this lightning is all super jagged, right? Um, how big are those little jagged chunks? So we have the potential difference. It's 5 times 10 to the 7. So that the difference between the potential here and here is 5 times 10 to the 7 volts. And so the electric field re that's required to be strong enough for electrons to jump there, to like break through that, that air, that electric field is 3 times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb. And if I put that in my calculator, I get a value of 16.6 meters. All right. So roughly, I mean, let's say in general, 15 to 20 meters are the lengths of each of those little squiggles that you see when you see lightning flash in the sky. So you know, you're, you're looking at lightning in the distance and you see the right? All those little are 16.6 meters long because that is the distance required to get the, the sufficient potential difference to actually have dielectric breakdown where you have the electrons willing to jump from one part to the other. Um, again, I absolutely love the fact that we can explain so many of the things that we see through basic first semester physics that you take, you know, on your way to becoming doctors or professionals in the medical field. It's pretty cool.